All right, what I want to talk about now is let's talk about homicides. All right, let's talk about what it is about photographing a homicide that makes it challenging versus other crime scenes. And in particular, of course, the one thing about a homicide that's different from, let's say, an assault or an arson or a robbery is the fact that we have a body, right? So what I want to focus on is talking about photographing bodies. How do we take pictures of bodies? Well, remember that a body is like a piece of evidence. And some of you I know came on the tour of the medical examiner's office with me yesterday, and some are going to come on the tour next Tuesday. You'll notice when you come to the MD's office, uh, the bodies that are kept there are all in body bags, and inside that body bag, or on that body bag, there are labels just like you label a piece of evidence. If I were to collect a piece of evidence from the crime scene, so let's say, let's say that this battery, for example, was a piece of evidence, and I collected it from the crime scene, I'm going to put it in a bag, and I'm going to I'm going to seal the bag, and I'm going to mark it with the case number, the <coughs> date, my initials, and an item number. Well, guess what? They do the same thing with the body. You put a body in a bag, we seal the bag, we mark the bag with the case number, the date, the initials of the person who has bagged them, and then the difference is we don't put an item number we'll usually write on the side of the body if we have the name of the deceased, their name. The reason I bring that up is... A body is like a piece of evidence. And we already know this about evidence. Whenever you photograph evidence, you photograph it a minimum of how many times? Three. Just like any piece of evidence, we're going to take long range photos of the body first, then medium range photos of the body, and then we're going to take a lot of close ups. So I just wanted to get you in the mindset. Photograph the body just like it's a really big piece of evidence. All right? All right, in terms of photographing the body, because it's a piece of evidence, we're going to start with what? So if I have dead Bob on the ground here, if I'm getting ready to photograph dead Bob, do I start right here snapping photos? No, what would I start with? Long range and medium range photos. So I'm going to start with my long range photos. I'm going to be standing here, right, 10 to 20 feet away, taking a photo of dead Bob, showing his location within the room. Then I'm going to move up, and now I'm going to take a photo of dead Bob from about 5 to 10 feet away. Now I'm doing my medium range photos. Now here is where we differ a little bit. This is where we differ from if I was just photographing a gun. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take an overhead photo of Bob. So I'm going to come up next to Bob. I'm going to take an overhead photo of Bob. Here's the problem, though. Dead Bob is 6 foot tall. I'm only 5 foot 7. When I take this overview photo, the problem is going to be is I'm going to not probably get his feet and head in the photo. So what am I going to probably need at this stage? This is when I need that step ladder. So that I can get up above Bob and take my photo looking down. Right. In the olden days, if you looked at old crime scene photos, they actually had these really huge tripods. And they would mount the camera way up here on this tripod. In fact, if you look at really old crime scene photos of like gangsters from like the 1920s, you can see the legs of the tripod in those overhead photos. We don't tip to put the camera on a tripod. We simply just get above the body and take that over. What's that? It's just easier that way. All right. Now, once I've taken my overhead photo, looking straight down, now I'm going to work my way around the body, kind of like I four-cornered the room. What I'm going to do is I'm going to four-corner the body. I would do the same thing if I was photographing a car. We four-corner a car that's involved in an accident. We're going to four corner of the body. So once I've taken an overhead photo, now I'm going to take photos of the body from all four sides, typically from a distance of about five feet away. About five feet. So I'm going to back up about five feet. If I can, I would like to start by taking photos towards the head. So if the body's prone, I want to start from where the head is. Now we have a problem here because where the head is, the wall's in the way, right? If I can, though, I want to take a photo from about five feet away. So imagine if instead of dead Bob being right there, I imagine he's laying in front of me here. I would take a photo towards his head first. Remember, I'm going to four-corner it. Remember, always be consistent. I like to move to my left, so I would move to the left side. So now what I would do is I would take a photo. By the way, don't step over the left body like I did. I would take a photo from the left side. Again, I'm about five feet away. Photo from the left side. Now I'm going to move around. Again, I'm moving to my left. 
Taking a photo, again, about five feet away towards the feet. Again, moving my way around about five feet away from this side. Full body, that's why I need to be about five feet away. Okay. If you need to back up a little farther, maybe you're taking a picture of a seven foot tall NBA basketball player, you might need to be a little farther than five feet. All right. Uh, then zoom out. So that's a good, so, so Joanne asked a good question. What if the wall's right here? Get as far back as you can, and then if I needed to, I can take my lens and zoom out. So instead of staying at 35 millimeters, I can zoom out to 18 millimeters so I can get the whole body in the photo. Yes, you could do that too. That's again why that ladder can be helpful. Now, once I photograph the body from all four sides, so again, I start with what? Long range, medium range, overhead, four corner. Now what I want to take a look at is, are there, is there anything on the body that's important? So what I would do then is I'm going to come take a good hard look at the head and face. As long as it's visible, I'm going to take photographs of the front, the head, the face, the top, the sides, and then the back. Now in this situation, because the person is laying on their back, I can't photograph the back of the head. Should I roll the body over in order to photograph the back? No, we're photographing the body as is. Now, what if, as I'm photographing the face, what if there's a tattoo on there? So now that tattoo is a piece of evidence. Any piece of evidence gets photographed how many times? Three. The only difference now is my distance has changed a little bit. So let's imagine that there's a tattoo on his left cheek. My long-range photo now, I'm not going to back 20 feet up. My long-range photo of that tattoo on his cheek is going to be taken from about five feet away. I'm going to move a little bit closer for the medium range. And then I'm going to move really close, within about two feet, for the close-up. Because it's a tattoo, I also need to take at least one other close-up using what? Scale, Scale and uh, <coughs> color card. Because it's a tattoo and the color of that tattoo is important, I'm going to make sure I'm also using what on the camera? Flash to make sure you get color, right? Okay, so I photographed head and face. Now I'm going to photograph torso. All right, let's say I can see in the shirt that there's this bright red stain, obviously some sort of a wound. I don't know if it's a gunshot or a stab wound, though, right? So I'm definitely going to photograph the red stain on the shirt. It's a piece of evidence. I'm going to photograph it how many times? Three. You know what, though? I'd really like to see the wound. Should I unbutton the shirt to take a photo of it? No. Again, we're only photographing it as is. Remember, this body is going to be photographed at least three times. Once by me as the crime scene investigator. Another by the scene person from the Maricopa exam, uh, medical examiner's office. But then also, remember, during autopsy, it's going to be photographed again. Right? So I'm going to photograph it as it. Now, after I've done the torso, I'm looking at the arms and hands. I can see that there's a wound right there on the forearm. Again, three photos at a minimum. Long range, medium range, close up. Legs, then feet. Make sense? Tattoo, what if the tattoo is like on his forehead? How do you get a scale or color? That's okay, so that's a good question. So Del says, what if the tattoo's on his forehead? I, I get a helper. Grab someone who can hold the scale next to it so I can take a picture of it. Right? Typically when you're at a scene, you're not there on your own. You've got other people that can be there to help you. Grab the detective, grab another crime scene investigator, ask them to hold that for you. Good question. Uh, Ron, can you grab the last one real quick? I want to show you some examples of some photos um, that exemplify the reason to four-corner the body. These, this photo is interesting in that this is not a crime scene photo. This is actually a photo taken by the perpetrator of his own victim. So this was a photo that was discovered when the, the suspect was arrested and they did a search warrant. Yes, exactly right. Now, if you notice the position that the body is in, um, this person uh, would lure men to his home, young men, usually uh, late teens, early 20s. He would bind them and they would torture and kill them. And you can see in this particular situation how he's actually bound the person's feet behind, in some cases their arms behind. Here's another photo from that same suspect of a different victim. But no, do you notice that there's some similarities, right? You've heard the term M.O. What is M.O.? 
modus operandi. modus operandi, method of operation. It's very common for a criminal to do the same thing in multiple crimes. Maybe they position the body in a certain way. Maybe they use a certain knot that they tie when they bind their victim. Maybe they choose a certain type of victim. Maybe it's a, a, a younger, blonde female, or maybe it's an, an older, uh, white male, whatever it happens to be. They, that's part of the MO. Sometimes the positioning of the body is part of the MO. So when we four-corner the body, what we're doing is we're trying to capture that position. That orientation, right? So uh, these photos come from uh, in Glendale. I think these are along the tracks. I think near Grand. Um, so this was a person who was hit by one of the trains. By the way, um, can you grab the lights for me? I think you can see these with the lights on. I don't understand this about Phoenix. I, where I grew up, there are train tracks everywhere. I'm from northern Utah. I'm from an area called Ogden. And almost all uh, railroad traffic in the West goes through Ogden. It's like the hub of railroad traffic, which means that everywhere that I live, there are railroad tracks everywhere. Which also means that when you go somewhere, you always plan on, by the way, that's why, for those of you who take my classes long enough, you know, I'm on time. Because I plan on always being somewhere 10 minutes early. Because where I'm from, inevitably, you're going to get stopped by a train. And so you just always plan on 5 or 10 minutes having to wait for a train. So you always plan on being early. Does that make sense? The reason I tell you that is, where I'm from, there are train tracks everywhere. Guess how many people die on those train tracks? A lot. None. Nobody ever dies on those train tracks. <laughs> now, here in Phoenix, we have like one freaking set of railroad tracks, right? <laughs> it runs along Grand Avenue. You know how many people die on those railroad tracks every year? A, A crap ton. <laughs> Why is that? Well, for one reason, you know how many bars and strip clubs there are along Grand Avenue, along yes. those trail tracks? There's a crap ton. So, I don't know if it's because people get drunk and they just wander out on the tracks and they get hit, or they get drunk and then they pass out on the tracks and they get hit, but there's a lot of them that die on those rural tracks. I don't know what happened in this particular situation. Is I this, do know he was hit by the train. Is this the same thing that Jason knows? Yes. Yeah. He was um, taking a nap. Taking a nap. There you go. Yeah. Great place to take a nap on the train tracks. All right. So the reason I want to show you this photo, so uh, these, these were good examples of that process I was talking about. So remember, you have your long-range photo first, then you have your mid-range photo. What's after those long-range and mid-range photos? Overhead. So this is that overhead, right? So this is the overhead photo. Good example of the overhead photo, right? What do you do after you do the overhead photo? Four corner, not close-ups yet. Four corner. Where do you start? Well, you back up like and you photograph. Well, in this case, where the head. Was. Would have been, right? It's gone now, right? But again, photograph from the head. What do you do next? You move your way around the body, so you move to the side, right? So now we see from the side. What do you do next? Move to the feet, right? Then you move to the other side, right? So this is a good this is a good example of that sequence. Long range. In this case, the long range was so bad, was difficult because the train was still there. Alright? Then our overhead. Four corner from the head, from the side, from the feet, from the other side. So the, the train, the, the, the train actually moved. Uh, I'm sure if their conductor was watching, they would have seen it. Now they would have yeah. felt it. Yeah, I'm just saying that's not a big property. All right, so here's another example. It was Dif this is a this was a, a car accident we photographed at DPS. This was a person who was ejected from the vehicle. Um, uh, some, of the, some of the worst scenes, by the way, are ejections. People say, oh, oh I hate to go to a homicide. Homicide's a piece of cake. <laughs> Suicide's a piece of cake. It's, it's a gunshot, it's a little bit of blood, especially if it's fresh, because there's no decomp yet, it doesn't smell. smell. But when you have two cars that hit each other, and then one goes flipping at 80 miles an hour, and three or four people come flying out of the car, and then they hit the... But the guy survived? Yeah. The, the guy yeah. flew out of the car still in the Yeah, he survived amazingly enough. Yeah. This, this young lady did not. So this young lady came out of the vehicle, uh, and then... So why is she so Because when you come out of the vehicle and you hit something, okay. you hit a your your missile barrier. Your missile. Yes, even, even if you just hit the ground and there's rocks and stuff, it just tears you okay. up. So the only reason I want to show you the photos is this is an example of four cornering. 
Notice that you can see different details in each photo. And that's the reason we four corner. If I, if I only took a photo from the feet, I might miss details that I can see from the sides. All right. So again, we do that four cornering in the plot. Because their neck was all cranked and broken. All right, another example. Again, this is again an ejection. Well, actually, this person was run over. Again, four cornering. Uh, I don't know if they were dragging or not. All right, uh, we talked about taking close ups head, body, arms, hands, legs, feet, wounds. Don't forget to use a scale. This, this is something that should already be in your notes, right? Because we just talked about it. Um, I mentioned before. Don't worry about disturbing the body at the scene to photograph things like wounds, because, like I said, they will be photographed again at the uh, medical examiner's office. I think this this is an amazing photo to me for two reasons. Okay. Yeah, dude's eating sandwich. Can I see that? <laughs> like this is a legit photo. This is not photoshopped. This is not. This is a legit photo from. And this is not our medical exam. This is not medical by the way. But there's a dude eating a sandwich in the corner. And you see how they're using the shears, yeah, like the garden shears? That's, that, they have those. If you come on the tour of the Eddie's office, the big garden shears, they use those to cut through the ribs when they remove the chest plate to be able to get to the organs. They also use them, it, the, the muscles in your jaw that hold your lower jaw are very strong. And sometimes they have to actually remove the lower jaw. So they'll use them to cut through the, the tendons and the ligaments and the muscles too. So anyway, uh, if the body will be photographed again. Uh, I think I showed you guys these photos before, but there's a reason I want to show you them again. This is a gentleman that was hit by a car, went underneath the car, got dragged quite a ways, got eaten up, churned up. So remember, the body's going to be photographed again at the medical examiner's office. The reason I want to show you this body is because there's a couple of wounds that exemplify the importance of that long range, medium range, close up. Can you grab the lights for me real quick, Ron? So you can see this body's pretty chewed up, right? There are lots and lots of wounds. I want to focus for just a moment on this wound on the inside of the lower left leg. This is a good example. When you're photographing a wound, this is a good example of what would be the long reach photo. Again, it's from about five feet away. So we can see that there's a wound here on the lower left leg. The point of this photo is to show where it is, right? Now we move a little closer. Now we can see that wound. And by the way, one of the things they'll do during autopsies, they'll clean it up a little bit too. So you can see they've kind of cleaned it up. So there's that wound again. So this is more of that medium range photo once it's been cleaned up. Now here's a close up photo, again taken from one to two feet away. Notice what they've included in the photo. We have that scale. There's not a color card, but one of the things that's nice about this photo is the body back in the background acts as a color balancing tool, which is nice. But if all I showed you was this photo, the one with the wound, Without the prior photos, if I if I were to ask you where is that wound on the body, and I hadn't showed you the pre prior photos, would you have been able to tell me? Probably. It almost looks like it would be on the breaker. The... Yeah, it, it, you're, you're you're probably pretty sure it's on an extremity. It's on an arm or a leg. The question is, you don't know if it's an arm or a leg. You don't know if it's a left leg, lower leg. So you you see how. It's even when you're photographing things like a tattoo or a wound, you still have to remember long range, medium range, close up. Right? Another example, same body. So on the upper right leg, on the thigh, there looks like there's an impression of some sort. Um, when people get hit by cars, it is not uncommon to get uh, impressions uh, in their skin left by the vehicle. For example, let's say you got hit by a Ford truck. It is not uncommon to have in the person's chest literally the shape of the grill, and sometimes you can even see four right there in the middle of their chest. So anyway, this person uh, was hit. I don't know for certain if that's what that is, but it looks consistent. We sometimes see those impressions in the body. So up on the upper right leg, we have that wound. This is again is a good example of a long-range photo. All right now we have that close-up photo, right? If I had only shown you that photo and hadn't shown you this prior one, right? So I had showed you that the impression there, if I only showed you this photo, you'd have no idea where that was, would you? Do you guys see the, the value, the need of having the long range and medium range photos? All right. We saw this photo before. What's the, what's the problems with this photo? Same case, by the way, the lighting. All right, so we have issues. We have a shadow. 
So this photo was taken outside during the day, which was fine. But what was not used in the photo? Flash. Flash. Flash is important because now we have a shadow. We can't quite see the entire tattoo, which, by the way, has a name in it. All right, I think it says James underneath. Also, what else are we missing in this photo? Scale. No color card, no scale. And also, where where is this tattoo? Is this on the? It, it looks like it's on the arm somewhere. Is it on the left arm or the right arm? No idea. So we're, we're missing some stuff here, right? So we we gotta be careful. We gotta make sure we're using color card scales and making sure we're taking long range and medium range photos. All right. Uh, we're gonna skip past that one. Uh, would you grab the lights for me real quick, Ron? We're almost done, folks. I got ten more minutes. Here's another example. Of this photo. Oh, actually, keep the lights off. I'm sorry, Ron. <laughs> I can't see it. Keep, keep the lights off. I want to show you some other wounds real quick. All right, these are puncture wounds. Um, but this is also exemplifying this concept I'm talking about. Where are these? Um, what are we missing? Like a oh, yeah. yeah, it looks like it could be the inside of the arm, because those creases in the skin. Could be the back of the knee, but keep in mind, Sometimes people get those creases in their in their sides too. The problem is without the long range or medium range photos, you have absolutely no idea where these are at, right? You need reference. Remember before I said that sometimes you can get impressions in the skin? This guy got kicked in the head. Right? So you can literally see the zigzag pattern of the tread in the shoe. We can see that with the a car tire too. We have people get run over all the time. That when we when, when they remove the clothing, you can actually see the tread of the tire in their skin. So you can we can actually photograph that and then do a comparison to the tread of the. So if we had hit and run, for example. If we track down the car, we can compare the tread pattern on the tires to the tread pattern that's impressed in their skin. So photograph those things as well. Almost done. A couple more things I want to show you. Uh, look at these here. You guys know what these are called? Okay, so we have the massive gash. But look at the small, look at the small, those are not, these are slicing, this is not stabbing. They're cuts. These are called hesitation wounds. Sometimes when a person uh, commits suicide, they, maybe they're, 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 there's a little hesitation, they don't push as hard, and so you get these small cuts. So the small cuts that are surrounding the really large one, those are called hesitation wounds. That's very consistent with a suicide attempt. Where a person just does, and it, and it can happen in the throat, and it can happen in the, the wrist. So those are hesitation wounds. Guess what we do not see at all of in this photo? There's no hesitation wound there at all, right? That's a deep, deep, deep cut, right? All right. So other things we want to make sure we're photographing on the body. Any signs of drugs or alcohol use? So if we have any track marks where a person is using needles a, a great deal, keep in mind we, we're going to have to look in places that. Obvious places would be on the inside of the arms, but remember, sometimes people will shoot up between their fingers, or sometimes between their toes, the back of their legs, there's lots of places. So, um, these are stab wounds. The reason I want to show you these is, there, sometimes there's a misconception that stab wounds are little teeny tiny. Remember, your skin's very elastic, which means that when it's cut, it has a tendency to open up. So these are stab wounds. Now the other thing I want to point out here is, how many stab wounds are there there? A lot. A lot. I'm not going to count them up. Let's say there's over 30. Uh, yeah. Do you think that this that this person, um, that uh, this was self-defense, that the person stabbed, maybe this person attacked someone and the other person attacked it in self-defense? No. 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 This is probably a crime of passion. Think back to Jody Arias. When Jody Arias murdered Travis Alexander, she stabbed him over 30 times. She sliced his throat from ear to ear, and she shot him in the head. What was her defense? What did she say it was? She said it was self-defense. Yeah. You don't stab someone 37 times in self-defense. Well, she said that How come there's not a lot of blood up? It's already cleaned up. This person, that person was already cleaned up. All right, now, what do we see here on the hands? These are called defensive wounds. These happen when someone gets attacked and they're defending themselves. Think about, if I were to take a knife and I were to try to stab you, so I came at you with a knife, your natural instinct is to put your hands up, say, whoa, 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 try to stop me. And as I try to stab you, that knife will end up nicking your hand. Sometimes it can go right smack through the middle of the right. palm. These are called defensive wounds. If we have a person that's been stabbed to death, but we also see defensive wounds on their hand, that's important because it tells us what? 
Yeah, they try to defend themselves, or at least for sure it tells us that they were conscious at the time of the attack. Because keep in mind, if a person's drugged, they could then be stabbed to death while they were unconscious. So it's an important detail. You can also get defensive wounds from gunshots. Think about it. If I were to pull a gun and point it at you, your natural instinct is to do what? Whoa, hey, hey, buddy, don't, you know, you put your hands up, right? You're trying to create this barrier. And so what we sometimes see is sometimes people literally get shot right through their hand, and then it enters the body. So again, defensive wounds. So the point I'm trying to make is even don't just focus on the 37 stab wounds in the chest. Even those small stab, even those small cuts that are on their hands are just as important. Was she alive? Uh, this this person? No, this person. Well, actually, I don't know. I, this is not. Her hand is kind of. I don't know the answer to that. That's a good question. This is not. A, I turn remember where I got this photo, and I couldn't tell you for sure. That's a good question. Other things to photograph, especially in the case of assaults or sexual assaults, are the conditions of the fingernails, right? If a person's fighting back, clawing back, so we get you know broken fingernails. Also, the condition of the clothing. Um, when a person gets attacked, assaulted, it's very common for the, uh, the person who's assaulting them to grab their clothing to hold on to them. So as they're yanking, for example, on their pants or yanking on their belt, it'll, it'll do things like pop the belt loops on a person's pants. Uh, buttons off shirts get popped open. Seams get ripped. So when you're photographing a victim, we don't just photograph the wounds. We photograph the condition of the clothing too, right? Sometimes it's just missing clothing. Are they just, they have no socks on? We photograph that as well. All right, almost done. Uh, we're going to skip past that, just skip past that, just skip past that. All right, last thing I want to talk about is shooting by suicide. So I got five minutes to talk about it. Actually, I don't even have five minutes, but you guys are going to give me five minutes, right? Okay. Self-inflicted gunshot wounds. This is what I want to finish with. Self-inflicted gunshot wounds. A couple things to pay attention to. We need to pay a lot of attention to the entrance and exit wounds. How do you tell the difference between entrance and exit wound? Which one's the bigger, bloodier wound? Exit. Exit wound's always the bigger, bloodier wound. In fact, sometimes you can have very little to no blood around the entrance wound. Now, another way to tell the entrance wound is, if it's self-inflicted, the barrel of the gun has to be very close to the entrance wound. So one of the things we're likely to get around the entrance wound is something called stippling. We talked about stippling earlier this semester, but I'll refresh your memory. Stippling is partially burnt or unburnt gunpowder that comes out the end of the barrel and actually will embed itself in the skin of the victim. Now, the amount of stippling and how spread out that stippling is can be an indicator of how close the barrel of the gun was, or what we would call um, the uh, uh, working distance of the gun. All right? So, if it's self-inflicted, we expect the barrel of the gun, it must be within a couple of feet of the wound, right? And the reason for that is your arms are only so long, right? I can't, my, my arms are only two feet long. So if the barrel of the gun was four feet away from the wound, based on the stippling pattern, there's no way that's self-inflicted, unless I, I attach the gun to some sort of apparatus and I pull the string, for example. So the stippling pattern tells us, okay, the barrel of the gun must have been fairly close. Now, can you still get stippling pattern from a homicide? Sure, as long as the person who shot that other person was close range, right? So if, if I had a person kneeling down on the ground, I held the gun against their forehead and I pulled the trigger, would we get stippling? Yeah. Yes. So stippling doesn't tell us it's homicide or suicide. It tells us how close the, the barrel of the gun was. But if it was a suicide, we do expect to find stippling. The other thing we expect to find is that the trajectory is going to be going upwards, right? I told you before that the majority of self-inflicted gunshot wounds, once committed using a handgun, the barrel of the gun is usually held underneath the chin or in the mouth, and in most cases pointed up, right? So we expect that the entrance wound will be below the exit wound. That also means that if we do have an exit wound and we're looking for a bullet hole, we're expecting the bullet hole to be found where in the crime scene? Up. We're expecting to find the bullet hole up in the ceiling or up high in the wall. I can tell you I have never seen a suicide where a person put the gun behind their head and <laughs> shot straight down. Because I'm, not, I'm not being silly, but it's important to understand that we don't find bullet holes in the ground with suicides. Even when a person holds the gun against the side of their head, they still tilt it up slightly, right? 
So we're expecting to find bullet holes up. That also means we're expecting to find blood spatter going upwards. All right, let me show you some examples of these things I'm talking about, and then we'll be done. <coughs> so this is an old gentleman from Glendale that shot himself. This is a phenomenal example of some of these things I'm talking about. Now, in this situation, though, he didn't shoot himself with a handgun. He shot himself with a rifle, a long gun. All right, and a couple things about a long gun. The thing about a long gun, especially a shotgun, is the barrels are typically very long, which in the case of a shotgun normally, I have fairly short arms. I actually probably cannot reach the trigger of a shotgun if I'm holding the gun underneath my chin. So I might have to use a stick, or in some cases what we'll find is they'll take the shoe off and they'll pull the trigger with their toes. Now I'm not saying that's what he did, because actually the barrel of this rifle is fairly short. But if a person shoots themselves with a long gun, sometimes they won't be wearing shoes. Right? A couple things. Notice the blood spatter here. It's going what? Up. That's consistent with the barrel of the gun being held down low, right? Also, in a moment, I'm going to show you the, his hand. You can tell that he was holding the barrel of the gun with his left hand. He pulled the trigger probably with his right hand. Because you're going to see that on his hand is what is called back spatter, which is a splash back of blood, which is consistent with him holding the barrel when the gun went off. As opposed to if someone were to shoot him from four to five feet away and then put the gun in his hand, there would be none of that back spatter. So this is very consistent with suicide, right? So as we look closer, for example, on his hand, the back spatter, this is very consistent with suicide. This is an older gentleman who just decided to end his life. I want you to notice also the location of the suicide. Where did he shoot himself? The location in the home is relevant, by the way, because most people, when they shoot themselves, typically have a tendency to shoot themselves in certain spots in the house. Living room is not very common, by the way. Garage, backyard, bathroom, most common. Now, people do shoot themselves in the living room, but again, sometimes the family member is thinking about the other family members they leave behind and clean them. If I shoot myself on the back patio, it's much easier for my family to clean up than if I did it in the living room or the bedroom, all right? So I'm not saying it's always the case, but I'm saying as an investigator, the location in the home is relevant. All right, a couple other photos. All right, what do we see in this photo here? What do we see a ton of in the forehead? That's a crap ton of stippling. Now, the other thing you might notice is there's more than one gunshot. This part, there's several holes. So do you think that this is likely a suicide? No. no. So it's important to remember, the stippling tells us that the barrel was really close to the forehead. But this is not suicide, right? This is probably a person that was shot multiple times in the forehead and from close range, evidenced by the stippling we see on her forehead. All right? This one here, see the star pattern in the forehead? This is consistent with a contact wound. When a person actually holds the gun up against the forehead, the gun slams against the skin, and it causes the skin to, to split. So this is a contact wound. That means literally that they were pressing the barrel of the gun up against the forehead when they pulled the trigger. In some cases, you can actually see the muzzle, the shape of the muzzle around the wound. Here's a better example of someone who shot himself in the chest. Oh. See, you can actually see the muzzle end of the gun. You can see the shape around the bullet hole in the chest. Again, these are self-inflicted. Those. What do we see here? Stippling. You think that was self-inflicted? No, that kid's got to be about six years old. But you do see the stippling pattern around the wound. All right. So I don't know that photo ever real pixelated, but the uh, reason I want you to see the photo. Notice the spray of blood. Is that consistent with self-inflicted? No. Yes, that is. That's going it's upwards. Up. Upwards. We do not have people that shoot another person by putting the gun under their head and pulling the trigger. Why so notice so the upwards blood? trajectory. That is consistent with suicide. Why is it so much blood? Because he shot himself with a shotgun. Blew his whole head up. All right, another one here. Again, notice, notice the trajectory going upwards. Also notice what room of the house is this? The bathroom. Alright, that's it. I got nothing else for you. Can you turn the lights back on for me,